Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue talking about sedimentary environments and sedimentary rocks. So now we've thought about class, the next thing we need to think about is what are the common types of clastic sedimentary rocks. And this is going to correspond to section 7.5 of your textbook. So the first two types of common clastic sedimentary rocks we're going to talk about are conglomerates and breccias. Now, conglomerates and breccias are, a t are types of rock which contain clasts which are, in general, larger than 2 millimetres. This means they contain boulder-sized clasts, cobble-sized clasts, and gravel-sized clasts. And then those larger clasts are held together by a matrix of material that helps to cement them to form a solid rock. So conglomerates and breccias are dominated by, once again, boulders, cobbles, and gravel. Now, the next question is, is, well, okay, if they're both essentially the same size of rock clasts, how do we actually differentiate between the two? Well, the difference is all to do with how well-rounded the clasts are. So conglomerates contain clasts which are rounded to sub-rounded. Breccias, on the other hand, contain clasts which are angular. So the distinction is made based on how well-rounded the clasts are, and the classification of the rock as either a conglomerate or a breccia is initially based on how big are the clasts. So once again, if the, class, if the rock is dominated by clasts which are in excess of 2 millimetres, we're going to be classifying that rock as either a conglomerate or a breccia, depending on how angular or rounded the clasts are. So the next type of common sedimentary rock that we have is sandstone. And unsurprisingly, sandstones form from sand-sized clasts. Now, the majority of sandstones are quite well layered, so there'll be some kind of layering to the rock. And sandstones are actually split into three very broad subgroups. So the first type of uh, sandstone we're thinking about is a type of sandstone called an arco sandstone. Now, arco sandstones tend to have class sizes which are towards the coarse end of the spectrum when it comes to sands, and they tend to contain equal to or greater than 25% feldspar in the rock. So what we have to remember is that these size classifications of, of clasts don't actually say anything about what the clast material is. We're, we're only worried about the diameter of the clast. So in theory, you can have a sand-sized clast and it can be made of quartz, it could be made of feldspar, it could be made of diamond doesn't matter what the material is, it's just the size. So in the case of an Arco sandstone, typically you will have a minimum of 25% feldspar and normally the remainder will be quartz. Now in the case of a quartz sandstone, as the name suggests, this is going to be a sandstone which is dominated by quartz. And then finally we have grey wacky. So a grey wacky is rather a, a, a mixed sandstone and it's going to consist of mostly sand-sized particles, but there's also going to be some finer silt and clay-sized particles mixed in there as well. So your rock, your grey wacky, is not going to be exclusively sand-sized particles. In the case of an arcos or a quartz sandstone, they are going to be made almost exclusively of sand-sized particles, sand-sized clasts. The final type of common clastic sedimentary rock we're going to talk about are shales. So a shale is a type of sedimentary rock that consists of greater than two-thirds clay. So if you remember, there are two smallest class sizes are silt and clay. So a sedimentary rock that's dominated mostly by silt is going to be a siltstone. A muddy sedimentary rock that's dominated, well, that contains both silt and clay in approximately equal amounts, is going to be classified as a mudstone. And then finally, we have sedimentary rocks which are dominated by greater than two thirds clay size class, and that's going to be a shale. And shale is a very, very common rock, especially in quite low energy environments, so environments like the lake, in like lakes or the deep ocean. And very often, shales, because they are dominated by clay minerals, will take on this rather distinct texture, this, these very, very fine layers, which we refer to as laminations. So this laminated texture is a reflection of the minerals 
that actually make up the rock. And we'll see that in the next slide, exactly how the compaction of these clay-rich sediments leads to the formation of this laminated texture. So how do we actually take a sediment and turn it into a rock? Well, there's a few things we have to do in order to take our plastic sediment and turn it into a rock. So the first thing we do is if our rock consists of class which are typically sand, gravel, cobble or boulder sized, the first thing that's going to happen is the rock is going to be compacted. So the layer of sediment is going to be deposited and then over time more layers of sediment are going to build up over the top of the first layer and the weight of those new layers of sediment on top of the first layer are going to squish the first layer of sediment. They're going to compact it. And so what happens is, is the clasts that make up our sediment are going to be pushed closer together. So this is obviously going to mean that the space in between the clasts, which is normally filled by something, typically water, will be reduced. And so the water will be squeezed out as the clasts get pushed closer together, a bit like squeezing a sponge. Now, this goes for sediments which contain sand, cobble, gravel, and boulder-sized clasts. What happens if our rock contains finer materials, so silts and clays? Well, in that situation, we have, we're going to have a rock that's primarily made up of clay minerals. And clay minerals tend to have rather a distinctive shape. They tend to have quite broad crystals that are quite flat. So think of them like a piece of paper. Now, in your uncompacted sediment, you will notice that these crystals of clay minerals are randomly orientated. And as you can see, there are these blue spaces in between them, and these represent the pore spaces. So once again, those are typically filled with a fluid, normally water. So what happens when we compact our clay-rich sediment? So this is going to be silt and clay-sized clasts. Well, when we compact it, you will notice, first of all, there's a distinct change in volume. So when we compacted this uh, sandy, uh, gravelly, cobbly or bouldery sediment here, you'll notice there was a reduction in volume, but it wasn't massive. In contrast, when we compact our silt and clay size sediment, you will notice the reduction in volume is quite huge. And this is because when we begin to compact these clay crystals, they will naturally begin to orientate themselves parallel to each other. So we are squishing this block of sediment here from the top and from the bottom. And so this causes the clay minerals to arrange themselves left to right. Okay, so by organizing themselves left to right, you will see they are now all nicely lined up and running parallel to each other. This is going to produce a muddy sedimentary rock that's going to have a fine layering to it. So the layering that we can see in rocks like shale is a reflection of the compaction of these muddy sediments and these clay crystals being forced to align themselves parallel to each other. Now, in both of these cases, though, we don't actually have a rock yet. And this is because all we have is compacted sediment. In theory, if I was to take a shovel and try and dig through either of these, I would be able to do so because it's still loose sediment. There's nothing actually holding it together yet. So we need to come up with a method that's going to actually cement these clasts into place to produce a solid rock. And shock horror, that process is called cementation. So cementation essentially is due to the liquid, the material which is present between the clasts. So typically between the clasts, you will have water. And within this water, you will have dissolved minerals. Now, the deeper your layer of sediment gets buried, the higher the pressure becomes, but also the higher the temperature becomes. And so as the water starts to get warm, it's naturally going to want to start to rise and it's going to want to circulate. And so what happens is, is the water, which is in this compacted sedimentary layer here, begins to convect. And as it convects, it will begin to dissolve minerals from some area to take those into solution in the water, and it will begin to precipitate those minerals in other areas. So it will begin to you know, kick them out as solid phases. And so what you can see here is the water which is in between these uh, sediment in these class here is going to begin circulating around and eventually it's going to start depositing minerals along the edges of the clasts. And slowly over time, as these minerals along the edges begin to increase in thickness, they will begin to meld into each other. 
and these layers of cement will begin to lock into each other and they will begin to hold the class in place. And this process of cementing our clastic sedimentary rock is actually what takes our, it takes our compressed sediment and turns it into a solid rock. Okay, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.